Hello and welcome, PML fans. I am your host, Joe Zamore here, along with Stuart J. Mills, bringing you this week's PML Draft Center recap. Welcome, Stuart. Hello, hello. How are we going? Good, fantastic. We are ready to dive into these week two <laughs> matchups. Did, yeah, uh, welcome back to week two. Hope everyone enjoyed week one, and I hope everyone, uh, you know, enjoyed their battles week two. I enjoyed watching them, so we can get into it. All right, before we start, was there any games that uh, you thought of a team that bounced back really well from week one? Uh, yes, well, I um, really thought that the Wishy Washies, coached by Lily, did really well coming back from, you know, the loss in week one to, uh, you know, have a pretty much pretty dominant win in week two. It was a great match to watch. And, uh, yeah, I think that there, I've, I've made that game the game of the week, which we'll talk about later, but can't, can't go wrong. All right. Well, let's delve into the first battle for this week. We got the New England Chartridge versus the New Orleans Infernapes. All right. So starting off with your match again, it worked well last week. So I thought, hey, why not do it again this week? So... For me, the moment of the match was when you used Max Mindstorm to set up your Psychic Terrain, knowing that it would stop the Shadow Sneak. Mm. And it was a close It was a close one because I, another big moment was when Grassknot didn't work on Dynamax Lycanroc. Um, they're, both, they're both pretty pivotal, but I think the Mac, Max Mindstorm play was, you know, big brain. So we'll go with that one as the moment of the match. Well, how did you, you feel? Going, how do you feel going into the match? How do you feel... At team preview, uh, team preview. Uh, I it, he pretty much brought everything I thought he would. Uh, I led wrong. I don't know if you watch my end or his end, but all week I was like, I'm gonna lead Roserade because Scarf Roserade, Oko's Mammal Swine. He liked to lead Mammo, and for some reason I I was worried about that Mimikyu at team preview, and I ended up leading Incineroar, which almost really put well it did put me in a bad position i had to swap out and all that stuff so it, it, it was not the way i planned it but it was a win nonetheless yeah i had a question for you that turn one were you tempted to try and kill the memo uh not did, did, were you tempted at all incineroar no no i needed incineroar just in case uh mimikyu got out of hand and i can get some intimidates off mm. maybe even a parting shot because it, it was, yeah. it was yeah. Jin to live a plus one drain punch. Nice. Yeah, so I, um, obviously the Gastron was a safe switch, so it was the right play. But I thought, ah, uh, Joe might have been tempted to click a fire move there if he had one. But, um, no, it was definitely, your overall game plan was very solid. The, apart from the first few turns. But, um. Yeah, that and throwing know, away my Gastrodon <laughs> to uh, Togus. Yeah. Games. I was, yeah, I noted that um, forgetting Togekiss hands to Grass Knot was not so great, but ultimately it didn't matter because your Lycan Rock just steamrolled half of Melvin's team and um, Dragapult finally got to hit the field for the first time and got a final kill. So, I mean, I don't think you lost control of the match at all. Not a single turn, did, apart from maybe turn one with the leads, but overall, um, yeah, it's a pretty convincing victory for you after your week one mishaps yeah <laughs> mishaps in both weeks but luckily i was able to overcome it in week two yeah well i mean castro had you know already done its thing that it needed to do it was just that it happened to you happen to forget that togekiss had grass knot but um it wasn't it ended up not being too crucial maybe it cost you a uh, differential point but other than that i think it wasn't too bad yeah, I think I got real lucky with the Hitmonchan freeze. If not, that Gastro going down would have been more impactful. Yes, I agree. <laughs> but, um, you know, these things happen, hacks happens, and you just got to try and minimize the hacks. Or you can play the perfect game and hacks can, you know, screw you over and cost you the match, but you just got to try and minimize the chances of that happening, and I think you did. Oh, yeah. And Melvin was really on top of his game that week too. He was having a heck of a time. I saw his yeah. end, and he was he was real happy about his uh, his play, and for for good reason. He he was playing the hell out of that game. 
Yeah. Well, you know what? I really, I really like Melvin. I think he's a good dude. So, um, you know, great battler. And, you know, week one, week two in a, you know, draft league setting, you're still getting used to your team in week two. So, you know, can't take any too much notice of a loss, really. Just learn from it and move on. And um, I'm sure Melvin will pick himself up and go again next week and be, you know, back on the winner's podium. Yeah, I'm Perhaps sure he doesn't mind it too match. much sitting at one and one. Not like he's at zero oh and two. No. So. Exactly. He's not feeling no pressure. You didn't want to be zero. Oh <laughs> yeah, you were both. You were both one zero. Oh, so I mean, you're you are zero oh one. So you didn't want to be zero oh two either. So now uh-huh. we um, you're both one and one. Both one and one. Pretty close. Yeah, I need to get that uh, playing field balanced after week one. So did you have uh, anything to add on that one? I, yeah, it was pretty straightforward in my account. Um, I had nothing oh. further to add, really. I, I I enjoyed the grass not working, not working on the lichen rock, but that was more like a haha. I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've clicked, I've clicked heavy slam on a on a D max and stuff like that. So, um, you, know, you can't really discredit Melbourne for that. But you know, these things happen, and he won't get the grass again on a Dynamax. That's for sure. Oh yeah, definitely not. Well, that brings us to our second game of the week. It is the Victinis versus the Rebellion. It is. So, uh, Rick and Mike and Lucian Flash here going at it. Um, Rick and Mike with his two Ultra Beasts just going hammer and tongs against um, Lucian's one Ultra Beast. So, for me, the moment of the match was when Firamosa came in and just got to collect close, close combat for free. It happened several times, but the one particular point that was the moment for me was when it did like a million percent to Celesteela. It did you know, 80% or something, um, making Celesteela pretty much useless for the rest of the match. So for me, that was the moment of the match, as we're going to call it. Yeah, that was a very interesting game how that ended up playing out. Um, yeah. I think the fact that Mike recognized at Team Preview that nothing wanted to take banded close combats from Ferramosa, um, he was right. <laughs> he, he, he noted that really early on and you know, he led Blacephalon for that early pressure and Lucian was making playing catch up pretty much turn one after um, <clears throat> you turning out with Flygon. It was interesting that he was thinking scout with Flygon when he had nothing to hit Mandit Buzz with. But uh, it was an easy U-turn into Mosa. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that that pair of Mosa was putting on a lot of pressure in that game, and that, that was it was very hard to slow it down. Yeah, and I mean, every time Mosa came in, it got close combat for free. And I mean, the first time it came in, it chunked Arcanine for ninety percent. The second time it came in, it chunked Celesteela for eighty percent. You know, put it into the red, and basically forced Lucian to sack the Arcanine, which was, you know, not ideal. It's one of his defensive cores. So um, I had a feeling that Lucian's team was quite identical to week one. I don't know if he just didn't, if he didn't breed new mons or, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, the Life War Milk Tank and the Leech Seed Celesteela were back for week two. Might have just been a coincidence, might have been on purpose, but um, might want to change it up for week three, change change the strategies. Um, Mandibar's got to come in on pretty much everything. Uh, the pressure that Mike created was by momentum. Uh, I probably would have sacked the Celesteela after it got smacked for that massive hit, um, or maybe switch around with Arcanine to intimidate stack, but um, the Scarf Nero King could have come out earlier as well and killed the Feromosa. You know, sure, there's a Nero Queen on the team, but I think clicking Thunderbolt was fine, as you could always then sack Arcanine or something in the back if you wanted to, if you were worried about losing your Nero King. But, um, you know, he came in with flying on under 50%, maxed it, couldn't bring it back into the match. Mandibuzz got to freely roost in front of it. That stalled the max turns. And next thing you know, Persephalon's in. And it was GG pretty much from there. It cleaned up the Nino King, it cleaned up the Mr. Ryan, and it would have cleaned up the Celesteela too, but the timer robbed Mike of the win by um, the complete win. So he only needed one more turn. So it was really unfortunate. You know, it wasn't to be, but he took a commanding win. I think it was, 
you know, the most dominant time and win I've seen in a while. So, yeah, he can thank his two Ultra Beasts, pat them on the back, and roll them out again in week three. <laughs> That's always nice to see. I mean, it's a hell of a week when you can have your uh, two Ultra Beasts do the, all the heavy lifting for you like they should. Yeah. All right, yeah, well, they don't even need to Dynamax. So if you get a few beast boosts, it's all over. Especially with those Pokemon, because they're already fast as hell, and then they just get that one attack boost, <coughs> they're over the top. Well, I got steamrolled by a banded Blacephalon in another league about a month ago, and it was horrendous. Like, I never expect, I didn't expect banded for starters, and then the fact that it's got beast boost after beast boost, I just couldn't. <laughs> couldn't compete. I'd never seen it. No, I just couldn't. I didn't expect it, so I got steamrolled, and it happens. You just get, I think it was 5 or 6 that I got by it. Unexpected. Yeah, when they can catch you off guard like that, some no. Pretty much. All right, well, that brings us to our third match, uh, the Machesney Park Slowpokes versus the Battlefield Tora Cats, who have sadly dropped from the league, but we do have a replacement. But, um... <laughs> TD was the person who battled that week. Uh, next week, you will see the Picatonica Fire Squirrels, coached by Shelby, uh, in week three. Yeah, so it's a bit of a shame that the Toro Cats have dropped out of the league, but, you know, life gets in the way and things like that. Because I think, you know, they were improving and getting better week to week, but uh, the Toro Cats probably couldn't handle the pressure. Instead of, um <laughs> But yeah, I, I feel like uh, the Slowpokes had a really great match here. The way, for me, the moment of the match was the way a Prater played around the Max Sceptile. Uh, it was very classy. Mm -hmm. Siglif had the Siglif had the perfect typing for it, and the reasoning for his switches and stuff was super sound, especially when you take into account the timer pressure, um, the fact that he made all these predictions and stuff on the fly. Uh, Silvalli died to a Max Knuckle. Naganadel baited the Max Quake. Which was then dodged by Siglif. Uh The third move had to be Grass because you know you run if you're running physical. Sceptile has Leaf Blade. Um, Serena ate that, of course, and then he was worried a little a second about acrobatics, but um, physical Sceptile usually runs Sword Dance because it's attack. This attack stat's so low. So um, once Triple Axel took it out, good to go. Yeah, especially that was, uh, moment, that was my moment of the match. Yeah, that was the big reads that he made with the uh, Max Quake yeah. coming in, going Sigilith, and all that kind of stuff. He certainly knew yeah. what he was doing around that. So, exactly right. Um, yeah, he, he made good predictions last week as well with um, Air Balloon, the and things like that. So, everyone will always opponents will have to be on their prediction game because they know that he's going to predict. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, double bluff. <laughs> so, for me, Roxel Valley was not only a great bring, it was a great lead. Um, it forced the Dimanitan out immediately. Uh, he flame charged, which made him faster than the Hydreigon, which was a great play. Um, Hydreigon only took, you know, 50% or so from the Dragon Core before it switched out into Seismitoad. Um, I don't think it was a misplay in itself, but... Um, Clicking knockoff from this by the seismitoad was, you know, it's, it's it's one of those ones where you can't knock off the memory. So it was a pretty free. When he could have clicked scald or any free water move that he had, mm -hmm. um, yeah, misplayed probably the wrong word. It was kind of like oh, I scratched my head like why'd you click knockoff there? Um, Weezing came in, set up toxic spikes, and then promptly died as well. And in the blink of an eye, the Torquats were down six four. Silvali hadn't even left the field. It was just sitting there clicking buttons. So the Torquats were pretty much forced to max Sceptile then to stop the rot. Um, hadn't activated Unburned or anything. They got a free max Knuckle to boost the attack, um, as I mentioned before. And then the, the Gunner now was used as the bait. And Sigler, you know, that wasted a turn of Dynamax at least. Serena ate the max grass and a drain punch and then killed Sceptile with Triple Axel. Um, you gotta love it. By the stage, the Torquats <laughs> were quite far behind. Sorry? I said, you got to love it, Serena, putting in the work. Yeah, that's right. 
and then you know Hydreigon regained regain some of the momentum lost with U-turn, but all this did was allow Siglyph to max airstream, you know, add a rock slide to activate its weakness policy, killed the Darm, chunked the Aegis Slash, and that was it. The Garnadel ate the last two, and it was a really super convincing 3-0 win. I am very impressed by Prater in this uh, match for the Slowpokes. And that brings us to our fourth match, uh, <laughs> Team Tempest versus the FC Cramorants, or the CF Cramorants. So, uh, another entertaining match. I mean, they're all they're all pretty entertaining. I you know, you can't really stall in a 20-minute time a match, so there's no boring matches. But for me, the moment of the match in this one was when uh, Neuenburn throat sprayed the Boom Burst Tech. That was great. Um, it makes complete sense. I think I've seen it once before, but it's not something I see regularly. You normally see Neuven with specs or something because it's special attack isn't great. But um, mm. when you've got a plus one boom burst option, why not? So that's that was towards the end of the match, and it pretty much left Scrub with not much to do. He didn't have much left to take any hits from Neuven, and after it Dynamaxed, it was trouble. Yeah, that was so, the only Kiwi. That was the only Mon Kiwi got kills with too. Was those three kills right there? Yeah, with Neuvern. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so Kiwi goes two and zero now. So pretty good start for them. Yeah, it's certainly leading the way uh, with the, that two win. He's the only undefeated uh, player on our on the Kanto side so far. Mm. So I mean, that's a good two weeks. So for him. yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Kiwi thought that Scrub might lead Sand, but still led Darm and Sand. Um, Scrub did lead Sand. There was a few switches, you know, there was Nasty Pot, a long Persian, and there was a Scarf Cinder Race U-turn. Hippo came in, and eventually we had Dust Clop in front of the Alolan Sand Slash. And Kiwi kind of had a bit of a moment here and forgot that Alolan Sand Slash was a Steel type. As yeah. he continuously tried to toxic it. He was um, trying to I mean, ultimately it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, ultimately it's not that big a deal, but the moment he realised it's pretty funny. Like I, I had a bit of a laugh when he, uh, oh my god, I can't believe I forgot Steel type. Like that was pretty funny. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, he switched into Rotom to tank an Iron Head, and then he predicted the switch, so he clicked Hydro Pump, which missed the incoming Pound on. Kind of frustrating, but Spinef and Pound on would probably have beaten the Hydro Pump quite easily. I'm not sure how much it would have done. Um, he predicted another switch, so he clicked Volt Switch, but Hippo yawned instead. So you know, two turns in a row, not ideal. And then uh, the turn, the turn timer runs out as he attempted to switch to the Claydol, and Rodon goes to sleep, which is it was ultimately it ultimately didn't matter, but it would have been quite frustrating at the time, I imagine. Mm-hmm. It was an unfortunate couple of it was an unfortunate couple of turns for Kiwi. Uh, stole pretty much all the momentum they had to this point, which is um, obviously not ideal. Scrub essentially got a free switch into Drake Assault. You know, can't do much against Claydol. Got a free rapid spin. Um, he obviously thought that Claydol, which is you know, it's rubbishly slow. It's horrendous. Mm-hmm. It was going to be faster. It was going to be faster than the Sand Slash at plus one, but it was not. Which got demolished by a Triple Axel. Um, he powered on eight some Pyro Balls, and then Neuvern came in, as we discussed before, got off its throat spray, and it was pretty much GG for Scrub. As it maxed and it took out the Persian, the Sand Slash, and the Drake Result. Um, it was a bit of a down timer win for Kiwi. Like I was like, oh, yeah, that's a, the time was all over. All the action was in the last three minutes, but you know, it was definitely their match. Like I don't think they ever lost it, Even, despite all the stalled momentum and all the mispredictions and the errors. It was their match for the win, and you know they got a timer win, so yeah, they'll take it. I'm sure go two and zero, but uh. Yeah, less convincing than last week, let's say. Oh, yeah. I mean, it hurts the differential, but hey, if you get the win, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> exactly right. Well, that leads us to our next battle here. We got the Naruhata Hoppers. Still learning how to say that nickname. <laughs> Versus the Chicago <laughs> Chunks. Yeah, so this was a turn up for the books. I um, can't believe the result of this one, but uh, spoilers, it's Danny Mac, who, you know, we rated as one of the top teams in the triumph rankings, mm-hmm. got demolished. Got demol- I've never seen him 
be dominated like this before. So it was, for me, the moment of the match, it's a pretty obvious one, was where Klefki blew Weevil back with a steel beam, smashed it into another dimension. And, uh, you know, you don't usually see Klefki doing offensive things. So the fact that it, you know, what okayed a Weevil, great. It was great to see. I really enjoyed it. Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, I talked to Danny uh -huh. Mac after the match a little bit, and he was telling me how uh, last week wasn't his best week, he just personally. So he was like, right. you know, it, he's doing what he can, and he, I mean, <laughs> he's not he's not taking anything away from the Nairihata Hoppers. He did say they did outplay them, but you know, it's just like some weeks you got it, some weeks you don't. And uh, Thibaut well, when being your kill yeah. leader, that that's certainly gonna throw yeah. people off. Exactly. I mean. You know, when you're in any sport or any any game or competition, when you're playing someone who is generally really, really good, if they're having an off day and you play your best, that's your best chance of winning, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was already having an off day and he didn't play as well as he could and the Hoppers played fantastic, almost flawless, it was their game to lose by the end and they didn't, they won. So, um, I mean, right from the very start, you had Dog versus Cat, you had Thibault and Toro Cat facing off. There's a few switches around to try and get some of the um, momentum going. And we've all came in predicting a prankster move from Klefki, I assume, whether it was going to be T-Wave or something. Mm -hmm. But of course, Klefki, Klefki clicked Steel Beam and we've all got demolished. I mean, the triple axle miss sucked, but I don't think it was, um, you know, critical. It wouldn't have done a whole heap to Klefki, but um, it was cool to see it do something offensive. And then it went back to its normal job of setting up the screens and um, then it's uh, Misery Gear sacked it to uh, the Magna Zone that was in. And of course, that's almost a free switch to Garchomp, who Got came it. in, set up set up some SDs. Um, got really good predictions here where they, were, they knew they were going to get burned, but they sort of set up another Swords Dance to keep their attack higher. And it ran through Sandslash despite losing its Yachi Berry. And I mean, the Yachi Berry was going to be important next because of what came in, the Sloking. And it meant that uh, it survived the EQ and then it took out the Garchomp with an Ice Beam, which may, it probably might have died anyway, depending on the on the rolls. But uh, the Shaka Berry was a great bring by the uh, Galarian Sloking. So what did that do? That opened the door for Thievil. And you, you know, you, you hear Thievil was pretty rubbish overall, but man misery gear made it shine blew the magna zone out broke the dragonite's multi-scale dynamax dragonite revealed itself to be an agility set so misery gear in their video they they go oh it's probably a special dragonite mm -hmm. and then an air slash crit so yep yeah, they, they were right um the fact that it crit the, the dragonite then got destroyed too and all that left was a half health slow king and that was it all she wrote gg it was i want to call it a convincing demolition and you know I, I was here for it i was good it was really fun to watch so yeah you know, danny will come back this week and he'll bring his a gang i'm sure so misery gear will be glad for the win oh yeah and that's certainly going to bump him up on the rankings there too uh especially since it was such a big win in the 4-0 and well before that's that. right <laughs> Well, before time, yeah, I couldn't believe it actually when I saw um, how much how short the video was in comparison to some of the other videos. I was like, oh yeah, this is going to knock it out timer. All right, well that's it for that match. And uh, Danny, you know you got it coming up. And now we're hot to hoppers. Keep up that prep, and you're going to be good to go. Um, that brings up our next match in the Arizona Cardinals versus the Crushing Soul Valley. Yeah, so um, this match was uh, another one that was up and down. I um, watched it from the Cardinal side first, so I got to see most of the um, the big plays. Uh, for me, the moment of the match was when Golurk got blown back by Excadrill despite it being maxed. Mm -hmm. I think it surprised it surprised um, the Cardinals more than it surprised me, but I was surprised that when I saw it, I expected it to live, but... Um, whether it was Bandit or Sand Force or whatever. Um, yeah, Escadrille did the job in the sand against the Max Golurk. So that was my moment of the match. 
dang, so Golurk just got blown back while it was Max. Yep, oh, absolutely. Step back to another dimension by the uh, <laughs> by the extra drop. So at the very start, um, the Chargers knew Golurk was very strong against uh, the Silvales team, so he actually led it. Mm-hmm. And it was it was against a uh, lead Salazzle. so it was pretty much a free life orb poltergeist for the Chardinals, who they the poltergeist chunked Gigalith for the fifty percent. And as you know, when you click poltergeist, it tells you what the item is of the opponent yep. before it attacks them, and it set a jack button, so Gigalith got sent right back out again, and it sent in the drift limb, which it was flare boost. It revealed itself to be flare boost, which you know it's really seen compared to Unburden. Mm-hmm. But uh, when as soon as I saw it was flare boost, I was like, "Oh, that's exciting! That's you know something different to see." Um, it was a safe switch to P two though for the Cardinals because um, the ghost type that was in front of it. So Drift Driftman did click Shadow Ball, and P two accidentally clicked Trick Room instead of Teleport. Uh, the Cardinals were saying how um, because it was the two psychic moves in a row on the move list and just click the wrong one that happens it turned out not to be the worst thing ever because it meant that um Dragology could come in on the sylveon that was in and of course because it was trick room was up and Dragology is very slow it outsped the sylveon and threatened it with the poison moves <laughs> even better for the channels is that sylveon clicked toxic and once again that move failed due to the fact that uh Dragology was poor poison type um a few more switches later, and you got the Dragology in versus Salazzle, which got to show off its corrosion ability, which uh, allows it to toxic steel types and poison types. Mm-hmm. I I actually wish the corrosion ability was a little bit further, and I wish I wish that they could hit steel type moves uh, Pokemon with all their poison moves. But as it is, it's still pretty cool. It was cool to see a poison type get toxic, and uh, it was a surprise for. The Cardinals, when the Dragology did get toxic, but they they uh, realised that it was a it was cool to see as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Blaziken came in, took out Slazzle. P two got burned by the Slow King. Driftlim maxed. Clefable took a couple of hits, got Driftlim into the red, and I overall I feel like maxing the Driftlim here was not ideal. It was pretty ineffectual, really. Um, Clefable probably needed to go before it was going to be doing anything mm-hmm. too major. And of course, Driftlim still taking the burn damage and didn't have any way to heal itself. So it had one more hit when it was Dynamax was finished. So it defaulted the rocks away, um, gave P2 a chance to recover, which was probably the lowest health it was going to get. I don't know if I would have attacked and killed the P2 instead of defogging, but I guess with um, the ones I had in the back maybe getting rid of the rocks was the best idea that and um you never know um, if it even at least, had a move to hit I, the p2 yeah so gigalith came in there's a free switch to go lurk which set up a rock polish and dynamax and that's what we call a gg from there or so we thought um extra drill then of course came in as i mentioned before and blow that max go back with the eq it was a devastating blow for the channels they didn't get to use their max turns barely at all and you can hear from their commentary they were very deflated um <laughs> it's what seemed like a sweep well it was going to be a sweep right if he thought it was going to be a sweep and it ended up a lucky 4-3 timer win thanks to recover and roost spam which saved him in the end i think having been able to just roost and recover um with p2 and that to get the health back and guarantee the timer win they were at pains to show they weren't time stalling though, and I agree. I agree. They yeah. played pretty much the whole match as fast as possible. They were clicking the um, moves really fast. So, yeah. So, you know, he was very apologetic at the end. Like, I'm not time stalling. Like, it's like, yeah, okay, we understand your your game plan was with Go Luke and that can't blow him back. So, you take the win. You take the 4 3 timer. Like I said, it was an uninspiring end to a great match, but uh, some cool movesets, some cool Pokemon, and yeah, I think both of them will go. Will take some confidence going into next week. It wasn't the worst match in the some rallies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So something definitely uh, something we take it. stick around to see. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to our next match, and that was the New York Aqua Jets versus the Day Day Knights. 
and did Day Day turn the sun on this week? Mate, after the comments on Dusty last week, I told you he was going to come back with a with a blast this week, and boy, did he what! Um, he did. He gave. He gave a. Could, he gave a Braz Tippy the old Stewart special. Could could there be <laughs> a better moment of the match than that belly drum Charizard? Um, I felt bad because uh, on the video the Aqua Jets were talking about how you know they didn't expect the belly drum and you know they didn't prepare for it and etc cetera, etc cetera. and i just commented on the video saying bro i know exactly how you feel like i had that happen to me turn one he did it turn one and six owed me in seven turns so um that's the moment of the match for me belly jump trials are there isn't much out uh, much else that it could be um you gotta say that the lead matchup was definitely in the upper jet's favor you had whimsicott in front of swampert and as we know swampert dies to a blade of grass um, we've just got set up trick room. Unfortunately, due to Alex explaining a few things about the league on the second turn, they run out of time, and we've just got trick room, trick rooms again, which of course reverses trick room. Yeah. Um, decides not to sack the Wimscott, switches to Scrafty, eats a Shadow Ball, and then threatens the, the Decidui with a knockoff. Um, the Dusty sends in his hit on top, intimidates the Scrafty. It gets crit by the knockoff, but still doesn't do that much. Loses its AV, which could have been important if um, the match didn't end as it did. Hitmontop can't do anything to Hatterene, so Hatterene finally gets to set up Trick Room properly. And Dusty, of course, has a chance. He has one of his favorite mons, and he sends it in. And it takes nothing from the slice shot. I think Dusty, I don't know if he forgot about Magic Bounce or predicted a switch, but used T-Wave and T-Waves himself because Hatterene bounced it back. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that natural cure is not that big a deal, but the fact it needed to softball next turn to, you know, live some more hits, it could have been hampered if it got paralyzed. It didn't. But um, it did get paralyzed the next turn when Whimsicott came back in. So what does Dusty do? He switches to Charizard, he gets leech seated, but it clicks belly drum, and that's a GG. It's as pretty much TG as you can get. It was tough. I mean, I get it. It was deflating to watch. I can understand... You think you've got all this prep done for, you know, normal soul power or whatever, offensive Charizard, uh, especially offensive, and you get physically def- offensive. Um, the only solace I took from it is that I know he will never, he will always expect a physical Charizard now, or like it will be, always be a consideration. I always suspect it might be a physical Charizard when I see one. I mean, fly move, ground move, fire move was, an, was enough for a dusty to sweep. And Charizard takes the crown as a week two MVP easily. Easily. Shadow of a doubt. Easily. 6 0. You, you ain't going to get no better than that. <laughs> Physical no. buff. And the fact that, yeah, exactly. And the fact that he worked he worked towards that sweep as well. It wasn't just a turn one setup win like it was against me. <laughs> it was a slowly worked, picked the right time. I thought, oh, he got leech seated. Maybe he'll switch out. Maybe the this, this sweep won't happen. But no, he kept it in and away it went. Mm-hmm. He said, he can't leech seed me if you're dead. Exactly right. Can't leech seed me if you're dead. So that is a, that is a GG nonetheless. Uh, Fraz Hippie, I'm sure you'll bounce back this coming week. Uh, Dusty's, you, you can never know what Dusty's going to do because he, he's just all over the mm. place. But we give you that yeah, well, like, good job on that. Week. Yeah. Well, like I said, the turn two double trick room was an accident because he was explaining a few things about the league. And um, it was almost the same as the Kadol switch in the previous match where it was literally counting down from one to zero and it won't let you click anything then. That, whatever you click then doesn't count in that last second. So mm-hmm. um, that, with that I'm sure he'll be more aware of the timer, the turn timer in the next, in the next match, next video. Oh, definitely. Well, that brings us to our last match of the week, and that is the Wikiwaki Wishiwashis versus the Memphis Munchlax. Right, so I had this down as my game of the week. It was just so good to see Lily bounce back from her week one match. Um, for me, the moment of the match was when Max Riperia lived a four-time super effective Fisher's friend from Dracovish. And did a ton of damage back. Um, 
I expected it. Even Max, I thought it was going to die to a vicious rend. Draco is, of course, known for vicious rend. I don't know which nature and stuff it was, but um, yeah, it did it did a million percent, but it didn't kill it. So um, Draco Rich was put down as a threat. That's where that solid rock came in. Exactly right. Oh, you forgot about solid rock. Yeah. So it wasn't four times super effective. Um, the leads were Rillaboom and Tita. It was an easy switch for the Munchlax, and it was an easy U turn for Lily, knowing that they were going to switch. Um, not scolding the Marwile with Polytone was interesting. Um, the burn could have been handy, but luckily the Focus Blast hit, and Marwile was left on 10%. Um, the next scored on the Quag Quagfire, though, yikes. I mean, it was a neutral hit, but in the rain it stung, and then it burned on top of that. And I think you know, Quagsire, um, it's always tough whether you're going to bring unaware. Uh, I think it's water absorb. Does it get water absorb? Uh, I believe it can. Yeah. So um, when it first switched in, I was like, oh, maybe it's water absorb, but it wasn't. It took in the, um, it took uh, over well over fifty percent in the rain. And um, believe it or not, Carmine Blissey was the perfect mod to come in versus the Polytone, as it couldn't do anything to it except for Haze. Uh, very lucky that she bought Haze. Actually, it was a good bring over. I think it was they bought Rain Dance last week, but um, <laughs> that crit freeze try that crit freeze try attack hurt. I mean, yeah, scald defrost you, but putting you down to that amount of health and it's, it hurt, and especially when you you know you think you're going to need the rain in advance, so you got to hold Polytoe back. See, it's the disadvantage that it has over Palipur is that it is quite slow, and um, you know if you want to have the rain, it's going to have to take a few hits. Whereas you can potentially speed up Palapur to be faster, I think. But um, Copycat Lipard was a fun tech. That was, you know, if if uh, Max Riperia hadn't lived that Fisher's friend, maybe I would have uh, picked something from the Lipard. But ultimately, it did nothing, unfortunately, because Blissey was relentless with its tri attacks. And uh, Lily was then basically forced to risk the burn or the freeze on Riperia as it at least resisted tri attack. So mm -hmm. sent Riperia in, didn't, didn't get burnt or frozen, maxed, destroyed the T-Tar. It got a Spadef boost because of the uh, sand. Um, and then uh, Max Quake. So, you know, it had double Spadef boost from those two things. Uh, Ate a Ficious Rend, uh, switched into Lipar to sack and save Riperia on its low health. Um, but Riperia had done its job at that stage. It had uh, done the damage on the Dracovish. It kind of went pear shaped when Scarf Rotom wasn't faster than the, than the Dracovish, though. I don't know if the Dracovish was Scarfed or Sand Rush because I didn't watch the video from that end. But um, River Room cleaned up Dracovish and Marwile, and then it did 95% to a max Blissey at plus two with Superpower, which was, you know, I love seeing Blissey get blown back by physical attacks. Um, <laughs> Nothing really, nothing, he had nothing that could have withstood the hit at that stage. So, oh, um, the fact that Blissey lived at all was pretty crazy. Um, and then Kingdra cleaned up the, the scraps, including a life orb unbreon, which was interesting. But, uh, that was a GG for Lily. And yeah, great comeback for last week. Um, thoroughly earned game of the week. It was a very back and forth match, but, uh, despite a few hiccups, I think Lily earned the win. Lily earned the win, so we take those. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, as good as she fought this week compared to last week, she she deserved that win. And Memphis fought really hard, but could not just he just couldn't break that wall in Riperior. No matter how much he tried. No, I think. Yeah, you know, I think the fact that Max Riperior is an option is going to be a problem for a few coaches going forward because. Yeah, Solid Rock, and the fact that it's so bulky anyway. If you haven't got any special attacks, it's going to be a problem. All right, and um, that leads us to announce, as though we already have. But we now announce our Week 2 PML Most Valuable Pokemon, and that is Charizard, <coughs> coached by Dusty Day Day. For the day day nights congratulations dusty well earned there well earned um surprised you brought it out week two but i guess after the week one disaster you wanted to show that you could give as good as you got so everyone else watch out for that charizard yeah i certainly knew that tech was coming the belly bump belly bump belly drum charizard 
Um, <laughs> Dusty has brought it many times in the past. I did not think he'd pull the trigger so early, though. So now everyone's yeah. on the on the lookout for it. So if I was you, I'd have an Excel Rock Pokemon or something ready for it. <laughs> is it also the kill leader? Does anything yeah. else have six kills? Um, as of right overall, now, overall. the league kill leader is... Yeah, Charizard is the lead kill leader by two kills for just that one week oh, there, attack. There you go. Double MVP. Double MVP overall <laughs> and week two. <laughs> Good stuff. Could he keep it going for the rest of the season? We'll find out. He's just going to bring Bradley Drum every week now. <laughs> yeah, he is. All right, guys. And with that, the last thing we have to cover is our Pokemon Masters League YouTube rankings. And we will go ahead and start with the Kanto side, where we only have one undefeated team in Team <coughs> Tempest, coached by Kiwi. Sitting at 2-0 and yeah, so, with a 2 differential. Yeah, so you're, you're a victim of Team Tempest, and they won again this week, so that's 2-0, mm -hmm. oh, which is a huge advantage in a tightly fought division. Um, the Gala division has also been quite competitive, but uh, you know, according to the draft rankings, the Kanto division was going to be the closer one, and so it has been as we've got one, two, three, four, five, six teams at a one on one. So um, differential is going to be quite important going forward, and thankfully, um, you guys have sorted out the land timer, the chess timer. So hopefully, we will see more matches go to the end. Oh, we definitely will. We'll see some more matches go to the end, and uh, differentials will uh, make a big, more, a lot bigger impact coming coming up soon. So yeah, we had um, you've got uh, the Cremorants, the Chartreats, the Hoppers, the Knights, the Infernapes, and the Trunks all on one and one in that order from two to seven. So, um, very very close. Everything to play for every week, which is what you want to see in the league. You don't want to see teams run away with it. Um, and even the Aqua Jets that are 0-2, it's early on, and the Aqua Jets have only just taken the team over. So coming into week three, it's basically their week two. So we'll yeah. see some improvement from then, I'm sure. Definitely will. So basically the team... So how PML works is top four teams in each division go to the playoffs. And right now the playoff standings would be a Team Tempest, CF Cramorants, New England Chartreets, and the Naruhata Hoppers on the Kanto side. Now we move over to the Galarian side, and we have two undefeated teams who should be meeting soon, if I'm not mistaken. They oh, they battle in week three, so ha, we're gonna wow, there you go. battle of undefeated. It's already happening in week three. Well, there you go. You got the Victinis against the Charizards, two uh, fire types, and uh, Man, what a crack it's going to be. I hope it's actually a good match. I hope it goes down to the wire because those are the best ones to watch as a casual observer. But, um, yeah, those are top two in week three. You can't ask much more than that. Mm -hmm. So we got the 2-0 and Virginia Bikinis at plus four. The Arizona Cardinals at 2-0 and with plus two. McChesney Park Slowpokes not far behind with the 1-1 one and one record with the two plus two differential. And the crushing Silvalis with the one and one differential, and I mean one and one record with a plus one differential, and of course everyone in the backs not far behind, and the battlefield tour cats that are going to be replaced by Shelby, coach of the Pecatonica Fire Squirrels. I'm sure she's looking to turn it around uh, come week three. Yeah, did, did, um, I haven't actually looked at she make me any changes to the team. She changed the whole team basically. Yeah, okay, so it's basically her week one, which is, you know, it's tough when you've got an 0-2 already, but uh, it's got to be done in leagues like this. But, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, but the Victinis are also number one overall with their differential, so, you know, they've got the top spot of the entire league to play for, mm -hmm. which is always a extra motivating factor. And um, everyone else is playing catch-up. If they win this week, they're away laughing. 3-0 and is an ideal start. And someone's oh, yeah. going to be three and zero. Someone's going to be three and zero. Someone's going to be two and one, and uh, everyone's going to be very excited to see how that battle played out. All right, Stuart. Any last results you want to talk about for this week two recap? 
Mark, I just want to say that overall, the matches have been really high quality. Um, I know that there's lots of new teams, lots of people switching in and out, but uh, you know, everyone's giving it giving it a good go, and no one has been absolutely demolished. Even Dusty getting a sweep with Charizard, it's not um, the end of the world. Yeah. We're all on week three. Week three with uh, five more weeks to go after week three is played. So a lot of Pokemon left awesome. to play and a lot of Pokemon left to sweep or, you know, tight net games, the ones we love to see. That's right. All right, guys. Well, we hope you enjoyed this recap. Enjoy those games later today. And we will see you guys next time. Peace.